You know, and that's a situation that's very much facilitated by deceit on the part of the parents. Because maybe the husband asks the wife, well, are you happy, dear? And she says, well, of course, everything's always going well in our household. <laughs> and what she means is, I'd like to take out a knife and stab you 15 times while you're asleep. But she doesn't regard that as an appropriate verbal statement, even though it might be something that she's fantasizing about deeply, you know, for, for hours a day. But there's no way that's going to come to light. You know, you, you can see these sorts of things happening if you pay attention to your fantasy life from a Freudian perspective. Because you'll see, if you can catch flashes of fantasy, especially when you're frustrated or disappointed or annoyed or something hasn't gone your way, you'll have little stories branch off in your mind. And those are these underlying id-like sy sy systems that are trying to inform your behavior. But they're kind of one-sided and single-minded. And... The, fantasies that they pop up can be, you know, pathologically aggressive or, say, pathologically sexual. But they're, they're attempting to make a case for a mode of being that needs to be integrated into your personality. Now, the other thing the Freudians noted was, say, the less sexual you are as an integrated personality, the more sexuality will manifest itself as pathologized in your fantasy. It's partly because... In some sense, it has to scream very loudly to get your attention. But it's also because if you refuse to allow something that's alive, a healthy path of development, it's not just going to go away. If you put a potato in a cellar and you put shine very dim light on it, all you get are these white spindly shoots that are hideous and, and, you know, and appalling. But the thing is trying to live. And, and the same thing applies from the Freudian perspective to the fundamental instinctual motivations that drive human beings. It's like they can be deeply pathologized to the degree that they're not allowed to be properly expressed. And then you can get more and more dissociated from them so that it becomes an increasing war between fantasies that are developing more and more to the pathological side and the ego, which is doing everything it can to increasingly defend itself from those realizations. So, here's a, a list. This is a good list. This is a very good list to think about. Here are some of the voluntary actions that people undertake in order to ensure that the unconscious, both as a repository of instinctual motivation and as a repository of memory becomes as pathological as possible. And so, one way of thinking about the Freudian unconscious, apart from the id element, which is the instinct part, this is more to do with the memory element, is, well, when people engage in something that's pathological, are they conscious of it? And the Freudians would say, well, generally not. But that doesn't mean they weren't conscious of it when they first did it. It's like the decision, it's like the decision to lie is conscious. You may forget that you did it and only be moving forward through time the consequences of having engaged in it. And the fact that you've made it habitual and that there are consequences may be something you forget and that becomes unconscious, but it doesn't mean you didn't know what you were doing when you first did it. And so here are some of the little nasty tricks that people play on each other and on themselves in order to ensure that they don't accurately represent the nature of their experience. And you might ask yourself, what does accurate representation mean, given that there's no way you can ever have a coherent and complete representation of anything that ever happens to you? And so one rule of thumb for that is that, well, you've accurately represented something that's happened to you that was negative in the past, if you've represented it such that you're not going to do it again in the future. Because the purpose of memory, in large part, is to stop you from doing the same stupid things that you've already done again in the future. It's not purely representational, right? It's adaptive. And so if you're twisting and distorting your memories so that they're more acceptable to you from a conceptual level, but not developing in this direction that would allow you to become increasingly adapted, well then, you're engaging, you're likely engaging in one or more of these processes. Repression. Well, repression is that you just don't admit it. I think mostly what happens when people repress is not so much that they actively repress. It's not exactly that they do something and they remember it and then they push it down. It's that 
they do something and there are some consequences and the consequences are complex and maybe they're motivated and then they just don't think about it anymore. Because it's easy not to think about something, you just don't think about it. It's easy. So in some sense, although this isn't a precisely Freudian idea, the default position is repression. You know, because most of the things that you do are complex and they require articulation in order to understand. You can just avoid engaging in that. And then the nasty little situation will remain sort of emotionally valent and attempting to pop up in your memory structure. Those are the sorts of things that maybe you remember that happened more than 18 months ago that still cause an emotional response when you bring them to mind. That's a good clue that there's something there that you have not articulated. Sometimes it's because you don't want to, and sometimes it's just because you can't. You know, you just, you don't know how to make sense out of the occurrence. You know, maybe you were bullied a lot when you were 13, it still bothers you when you think about it, but you still haven't been able to figure out exactly why. Denial. Well, that's just outright, you know, when you're dealing with a teenager and they're lying and you say, are you lying? And they say, no. Well, that's the end of that. Reaction formation. Oh, that was a sneaky one, so Freud would observe that, for example, in sibling relationships where, you know, one sibling is extremely irritated at the other, but the way they cover that up to themselves and other people is by overdoing it in the other direction. So, you know, maybe a husband is having some serious second thoughts about his wife, and what he does in order to stay unconscious of that particular bit of reality is act with excessive care towards her whenever they go out. And there's always a falseness about that. I mean, if your antenna are up at all, that sort of thing, actually, when, maybe it's worse for me because I've seen this so often, I'm sensitive to it, that sort of thing really turns my stomach. You know, when you see this, this saccharine falseness with which people treat each other, you know there's something god-awful brewing right underneath the surface and neither of them will admit to it. You know, a good fist fight would do them a lot of good, but instead they'll just torture each other to death with politeness for two or three decades. So, displacement, Laurie talked about that one. My boss yells at me, I yell at my husband, my husband yells at the baby, and the baby bites the cat. It's sort of movement of the problem down the dominance hierarchy. Identification. Um, you're bullied in school, and so you start bullying kids that are younger than you. Rationalization. Oh, this is a good one if you're intelligent. So all of those of you, you're all pretty intelligent. If you want to be neurotic, the best thing to do would be to turn your intelligence to the, to the function of rationalization. So that when you do something that you, is clearly not in your best interest or anyone else's, then you want to meditate on how to formulate a sequence of complex explanations that make that pathological behavior look positively altruistic. And then stick to that you know, as hard as you can in every argument that you ever have for the rest of your life. So, that's uh, excellent use of, of intelligence. Intellectualization, same sort of thing. That's usually when you dress up your neurosis with philosophy. And so you often see that in people who, instead of addressing their own personality pathologies, blame them on, you know, the pathological cultural conditions and try to foment revolutions of one type or another. Because it's pretty clear that they don't have the problem, it's the whole society that has the problem, and if it would just reorganize itself around them, then everything would be fine. I saw a good example of this in the Atlantic Monthly several months ago, where a woman who had, despite her best efforts, in some sense, not being married by the time she was in her 40s, blamed the structure, yeah, the entire structure of Western civilization for the continued failure of her dating attempts. Which, you know, that might be the case, but I would say that before you jump to that conclusion, you might give some consideration to the fact that perhaps you're integrally involved in that failure. 